All righty, we are live. We are live, it's official, we're here. So hi everyone, I already see tons of questions coming in from YouTube, from Facebook. Um, my name is Jenna, I'm Jenna Overbaugh. I am a full-time therapist here at NoCD and we're taking over for Dr. McGrath. We have big shoes to fill, Dr. Farrell. Um, so yeah, we're gonna spend the next hour chatting with you guys, uh, trying to answer questions that you guys have about OCD, about exposure and response prevention, and any questions that you have also about NoCD, our mobile therapy app. So um, I'll let Dr. Farrell introduce himself first and then I'll kind of trail afterwards since some of you might have seen me here on Monday. Um, so Dr. Farrell, why don't you introduce yourself uh, uh, just before we get started? All right, thank you, Jenna. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us, whatever part of the world you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Nick Farrell. Um, I'm a psychologist. Um, I uh, am the network um, uh, director for clinical training and development for NoCD. Um, I'm not even a month uh, into the role, but I'm already, Jen and I were just chatting before we got on. Uh, I'm already absolutely loving it. Uh, and I'm eager to have opportunities like this uh, to be able to interact with folks and hopefully impart as much knowledge and tips as we can so that you can come away from here um, even with just a, a few good kernels um, of you know what what OCD is uh, what it involves and how we can effectively help folks address it um, so without further ado what do you think Jenna should we get into the questions sure yeah so All right. um, and we would love to get to every question we try our best to answer ones that are gonna be applicable to a lot of different people or really unique questions that maybe have not been obviously addressed in previous lives. Um, so we'll just do our best. If you have questions, feel free to submit them and we will try to get to them as best we can. Um, so let me see here. I'm curious, Dr. Farrell, about your um, thoughts on this one. Okay. So can you see it? I can, yes. So I'll read it, I'll, I'll will, in case anyone out there is unable to read it for themselves, what causes OCD to come and go? Yeah, it's a great question, John. Um, we certainly know that OCD is um, by no means the same every single day. Uh, it, it, it's a course that tends to wax and wane. Um, and many of the individuals that we work with describe that, um, you know, it, it does kind of have its ups and downs. Um, there, there seem to be um, these kind of unexplained periods where sometimes OCD doesn't have as much of a grip on our lives. Um, and then sometimes uh, unexplained periods where OCD really comes in and seemingly infiltrates in every, every single aspect or domain of our lives. Um, we don't know a great deal, John, precisely about what factors that um, you know, contribute to OCD uh, worsening or becoming less intense. Um, what, what a lot of our members do describe is that really significant life events uh, particularly where there's a lot of change in routines uh, or things, you know, that, that might be specific to one's OCD um, can cause kind of uh, it, it to worsen or intensify. Uh, so, for example, let's say that, um, well, uh, I was just reminded that it's allergy season, lots of pollen on the trees uh, and, and the grass this morning when I was out for my morning walk. And for somebody who may have contamination focused OCD with fears that revolve around uh, like air quality, and if you know bad particles are contaminating my lungs, could it lead to a serious respiratory disease or something like that? You know, even just something is the change in the seasons. Um, noticing that there's there's pollen on the ground or in the trees, or just kind of you know uh, perceived contaminants in the air. Um, even hearing something like a weather report. Oh man, you know this situation is is um, you know, becoming more of an issue. And so it, it kind of draws our attention to it. So a, a, a lot of life things um, can kind of come up and contribute, particularly those life things uh, that are relevant you know, to whatever kind of key OCD features uh, or problem areas that we struggle with. And Jen, I don't know, do you, can you think of anything else um, that comes to mind uh, in response to this question? What causes OCD to kind of come and go wax and wane? Yeah, so I definitely also describe it as kind of a waxing and waning process. And I describe it from like session one, um, pretty much that it will continue to do that unless there's some behavioral intervention in the form of exposure and response prevention that um, it might feel better for a little bit. But chances are, you know, research shows that the history of OCD is that it does kind of wax and wane like that. I think that a lot of it too, and just in the research that I've done, just in the like clinical experience that I've had over the years, I think a lot of it has to do with how much 
are these values competing with that person's time? Like, are they able to engage in their valued activities? Um, and I think that's why the pandemic has been so, so much of a struggle for people. One of the reasons um, is that, you know, people aren't able to engage in those valued activities as much as they were before, like sports, um, hobbies, job, work, um, doing things with their family, stuff like that. And so in addition to obviously the contamination concerns and so many other ways that OCD has been affected by the pandemic, I think it has squashed a lot of our abilities to engage in these valued activities. And as a result, anytime we're not able to engage in those valued activities and we have more unstructured time, that's when I tend to see people struggle more. Um, so the extent to which someone is actively engaging in those valued activities, I think can definitely contribute to whether it's a more active phase in their OCD versus a more passive phase. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and there's just a really quick question about, is the NoCV app therapy available in places like, say, Central America? Um, so as of right now, we are available in all 50 states in the United States. Um, we are also available in the United Kingdom and Australia. Um, we are also working very, very soon on Canada. Um, and my understanding is that we're actively working on many other international um, places as well. So one of NoCD's missions is to make therapy and make ERP accessible to as many people as possible. So I have no doubt that, with, I mean, I can't even imagine where we'll be in the next year. It's crazy to kind of imagine and, and fantasize about, but we're coming for you guys. We're coming, we're coming for you guys. But as of right now, yes, all 50 states, definitely the UK and definitely Australia. So check us out for sure. You know, Jenna, that, that's so exciting. Um, you know, one of the things that drew me so much about No CD's mission is this idea that, you know, in spite of having a remarkably effective treatment, it's unfortunately um, rather unavailable, you know, to the majority of people who need it around the globe. Unfortunately, you know, one of the things we know is that the majority of individuals um, with OCD have precious little ability to access exposure and response prevention, whether it's with in-person therapy uh, or telehealth like we provide at NoCD. Um, and so this, this mission is just so exciting that Hopefully, you know, in, in a short while, uh, we will eradicate that problem. And the majority of people, you know, around the globe who uh, do meet criteria for OCD will, will have ready access to effective treatment. For sure. And I just know so many people who, you know, not being able to leave the house to go to therapy appointments or pack up their bags and go to a, a place like residential, like that's a core feature of their symptoms, right? And so I, what comes to mind most frequently for me as a good example of this is people who have postpartum OCD. Um, you know, they don't want to leave, they, sometimes that's part of their fears, right? Like they don't want to leave their baby. And so the issue of having to get up and go and leave the home and not be able to take their baby with them to go and do this therapy appointment, that's almost something that they need therapy for in the first place. So I love the fact that no CD has always been tele and that we have no plans on not being tele, that we're going to stay mobile. Um, because I think that, like you said, it's just able to reach people in ways that, are really unheard of and that people that the OCD community really, really needs. Um, okay. All right, next question. Dun, dun, dun. Have you heard of pandas? So can we talk about pandas a little bit? We can, we can talk about pandas. Pandas is a very interesting topic for those who might not know. Um, no, I don't know this by heart. I always have to look it up. Uh, PANDAS is short for Pediatric uh, Autoimmune Neuropsychiatric Disorders uh, that are associated with strep infections. Um, it's a presentation uh, that we see in OCD um, that tends to happen more frequently in youth. Um, and it's related to, like the name suggests, uh, strep infections. What makes PANDAS onset OCD different from um, other, other, other forms of OCD is that the onset as compared to the typical gradual worsening that we see is very sudden, very rapid. So quite literally, I've heard stories from parents that children go to bed one night, seemingly fine themselves, and wake up with like this overnight raging case of OCD um, that can come in, in a variety of different forms. It's not um, uniquely associated with any one um, OCD specific subtype. Um, it can also 
lead to a lot of the kind of body focused repetitive behavioral problems that we know frequently co-occur with OCD. Um, things like hair pulling, skin picking, uh, tick tick related problems. Um, and so Haley, yes, uh, in short, we have heard of this. Uh, we see it uh, from time to time. Uh, the good news is that um, treating PANDAS isn't fundamentally different um, than what we would do just for a more normal, straightforward case of OCD. Um, the, the general treatment recommendations um, that are available in, in national clinical guidelines indicate that what we do uh, is, you know, kind of by the book, uh, use our gold standard exposure and response prevention. Uh, the one addition uh, with, with um, uh, a, a PANDAS case uh, might be the, <clears throat> the use of an antibiotic medication uh, which can kind of treat the strep infection uh, that may be contributing uh, to this rapid onset of OCD symptoms in the first place. Uh, but generally, the, the cases that I've worked with where it's more of a PANDAS onset of OCD, um, that's the only substantial uh, change or addition to a pretty traditional course of treatment where ERP is the, the main centerpiece. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would echo that. I've heard from families too, where it's like their children kind of wake up and they're almost like a different person. Um, so that's a really kind of big red flag um, that these weren't just like these gradual onset of symptoms. The the child wasn't always that way with kind of those quirks. It was literally as though they just kind of woke up and they felt like they were a different person. Um, but yep, we treat those here at NoCD as well. So um, if you or anyone you know is concerned about that, um, then we can definitely work through those issues for sure. All right. Hi, currently I'm working on cutting down my compulsions by choosing some of them and avoiding doing them no matter what thought comes up in that moment. Does this count as a kind of exposure or or ERP? Um, so it's hard to tell with the wording, like is this an exposure or is this ERP? So for those of you who don't know, ERP just basic, it just stands for exposure and response prevention. So in therapy, it's really important to understand that we need to do these exposures, which are the anxiety provoking things that you actively go out of your way to do. Um, but you also need the ritual prevention or the response prevention, that's the RP piece. So that's what this individual is referring to by saying, I'm cutting out my compulsions, I'm trying not to do any of them at all. And so so balloon flower, I'm not sure by, you know, by the, just by the context that we were given, but it seems like you are kind of living the lifestyle of ERP, right? Like you're going about your day and you're trying to cut out some compulsions and you're trying, you know, regardless of whatever thought comes up, you are trying to resist your compulsions and, uh, and you know, not go down that line no matter what happens. That's good. Um, that seems more like response prevention to me, like just kind of living the lifestyle of response prevention. But of course, you know, I think of exposures as nothing but practice for you to practice ritual prevention. Um, so yeah, I mean, if you are actively kind of going out of your way to do this anxiety provoking thing, kind of purposefully and intentionally going out of your way, and then you're resisting the rituals, yeah, I would say for sure that that's an exposure. Um, with the response prevention, as long as you're not giving into the rituals. Now, I will say, I think, and what I teach my members at NoCD is that there are kind of two different types of exposures. There's the situational exposures that kind of just happen as life happens, right? Like you're walking, you're, you know, you're walking throughout Target and all of a sudden you see a kid and you have this intrusive thought, oh my gosh, what if I was attracted to that kid? Well, okay, that scared me. I noticed that I'm anxious. I'm going to walk on and I'm not going to go back and double check that child. I'm not going to reassure myself. That's kind of a situational exposure. You didn't purposefully go out of your way to do that. It just situationally kind of occurred. But the exposure was, yes, you walked by this child or rather this child walked by you. The ritual or the response prevention would be that you don't go back and check. You don't self-assure. You don't mentally review anything like that. Now, an exposure that's more assigned or more structured, say, by a therapist at NoCD would actually have you effortfully go out of your way to do things, right? So I would effortfully make one of, you know, with the collaboration, of course, I'm, it might be an exposure like, yep, three times a day, I need you to walk into a store, uh, maybe even specifically a children's department store. And your intention is to make time and consistently and repetitively go into these stores for the intention of getting practice, challenging yourself, putting yourself in these anxiety provoking situations, and then, you know, 
doing the response prevention afterwards. So yeah, it definitely seems like you're doing exposures and response prevention, but maybe more on just like the kind of living the lifestyle sense. Um, but you could definitely like intentionally do exposures, right? Like just plan them in advance type of thing. Dr. Farrell, did you have anything else to add to that? You know, Jen, I really think you've hit the nail on the head here that um, uh, Bal and Flower here, this is, a, this is a great step in the right direction that you've identified some of your compulsions and are working to um, prevent those. That's a, that's a great first step. Um, and as Jenna very astutely identified, we need the one-two punch uh, that ERP is. Uh, for example, if one of our members said to us, hey, great news, I've made some significant reductions um, in washing my hands or in checking locks on my doors or appliances or something like that, that would be a good step. Uh, but it would be even a better step if there was exposure that had preceded the response prevention. So, for example, that person's reduction in hand washing may have come without any exposure to objects or surfaces that the individual, uh, you know, perceives to be contaminated or germed or something like that. Likewise, an individual may cut down on checking locks on doors or checking appliances, um, but not really using those at all. You know, not not using the door to go in and out of the home or something like that, not using appliances. So we really, really need uh, the exposure and the response prevention to kind of work in tandem. That's that one two punch mm -hmm. that really kind of gives us the best bang for our buck. Yeah, I have an example. And I I said balloon flower. <laughs> Sorry, Balan. Sorry, Balan flower. <laughs> um, I was like, that's a funky little alias. Um, Balan. So and a, and a good example that comes to mind is. You know, if someone is really struggling, say, leaving their workplace, then maybe they're, you know, leaving their workplace at school or something. They have a hard time leaving their desk or whatever because they're afraid that they're going to leave something behind their phone, a notepad, a pen, some their keys, something like that. Let's say they continually say, Jenna, I'm having such a hard time. I continue to feel like I need to look back and check at my desk. I need to look back and check at my desk. Maybe it's maybe it's not. One route that you could take is, yes, get up and leave your workspace without checking. Another route would be, what if we intentionally have you leave something there, right? Like, what if we intentionally have you leave a pen or a low importance item? So there are really like a ton of different angles that you could take it, right? Like you could just do the normalized thing, which is get up from your work desk and resist checking. You could also kind of do that overcorrection, which I love. Um, and really just like Dr. Farrell said, like, just punch the OCD right in the face and like, okay, if you're afraid of forgetting something, let's just take it a step further and intentionally, purposefully, willingly put yourself in that place of discomfort and try to leave intentionally a low importance item and see what that what that does. And sometimes by going the opposite direction in a way that's a little bit overcorrecting can be just enough to like make the OCD back off. All right, Dr. Farrell, this question's got your name all over it. Shelly, I've been struggling with many subjects <laughs> since I was 12 or younger. I've been struggling with anorexia since the age of 17 with decades of therapy and hospitalizations. Do you think ERP would be beneficial? Well, Shelly, let me first express, you know, my sympathy that you've had, you know, quite a long um, bout, uh, not only with OCD, uh, but also one of the problems that we know, unfortunately, tends to co-occur uh, frequently with OCD, and that's eating disorder. Sounds like uh, anorexia, unfortunately, in your case, Shelley. Um, the, here, here's the good news. Um, in response to your question, do you think ERP would be beneficial? Uh, I want to give you a categorical yes. Um, I say that because both uh, Jenna and I and our team at NoCD uh, very much put our faith in the science, and the science indicates that head and shoulders above all their um, alternative therapeutic approaches exposure and response prevention is the gold standard treatment for OCD. Uh, I wish I could sit here and tell every one of you that it's a panacea and that 100% people uh, will derive benefit from it. Uh, I can't, but I can tell you that a very significant majority do. And even amongst individuals who don't experience a full and complete recovery uh, when going through a course of ERP, um, a good number of folks experience you know, a partial uh, symptom reduction. And what happens is, when we get at least part of the way there through a course of therapy, um, one of the cool things about ERP is unlike other therapies, it kind of teaches you to be your own therapist. So once you understand that in a nutshell, what you have to do over to overcome this problem is confront, 
feared scenarios, while at the same time preventing you know, your, your compulsions and, and typical safety responses, you've become very much your own guide uh, to tackle you know, what's, what's left of your course of treatment and overcoming OCD. Now, Shelley, you raise an interesting little addition here um, with anorexia since the age of, of, of 17. And what's, what's so interesting, given that uh, how you describe the ordering here, this is typical, Shelley. This is what we see when OCD and eating disorders co-occur. We actually see the OCD more often than not predate the onset of the eating disorder. And um, what's so interesting about that is we know that there's a tremendous amount of overlap uh, between obsessive compulsive disorder and eating disorders. And as such, um, there's been a lot of great work in the last 20 years looking at, hey, can we take this treatment, ERP, that has for you know the better part of a century now shown to be effective for OCD, can we bend it and twist it a little bit and thereby make it applicable to eating disorders? And moral of the story is the answer is yes. Um, if we consider eating disorders to be somewhat of a variant of a larger obsessive compulsive syndrome that might be characterized by obsessions around food and body image and compulsive behaviors that are often aimed at trying to modify weight or shape or minimize the amount of food that one takes in, um, you can start to see how using an exposure and response prevention treatment approach uh, can be applicable and really help someone that's trying to overcome eating and body image related fears and anxieties at the same time as more traditional obsessive compulsive features. So Shelly, I know you've been at this for a while. Um, I just wanna leave you with some optimism. There's hope uh, and there are uh, a handful of programs around the country that actually offer specialized treatment where you can dually receive exposure and response prevention for OCD uh, in tandem with the eating disorder concerns. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I just wanna offer similar kind of validation and that's, um, this has obviously been going on for a really long time and in the back and forth in in my experience clinically like what i've seen people struggle with who have this kind of overlap is that they can get really frustrated and that they tend to work on the eating disordered you know behaviors but then the ocd riles up or they work on the ocd and then the eating disordered behavior riles up and i think that just speaks to the need for us to really work on that overlap, which is a lot of times the perfectionism, the rigidity, the need for everything to be just so, um, the need for control. And so there's so much overlap when it comes to that, that that needs to be the target and treatment. And I think that's been what's probably been missing for a while. A lot of times with eating disorders, especially with anorexia, there's such an emphasis on weight restoration, which is obviously important, um, but it's like, okay, well, what, then what? Um, and so especially when there's this overlap of OCD and eating disorders, right? Like I think it's necessary for us to really target the that overlap of the perfectionism and the rigidity and routines and ERP can definitely help with that. Um, I know where I used to work, we would actually have like a separate fear hierarchy, um, which would include things like maybe going out in public wearing a shirt that was a little bit triggering to wear or, you know, short sleeve shirts or capris versus full on jeans or something like that. But then we would also have like a food hierarchy. We would have a legitimate like five page food hierarchy that literally listed every food that you could possibly imagine. Um, and just like we would ask an, a client to say, you know, on a scale of zero to 10, Shelly, how hard would it be for you to do this? We would ask on a scale of zero to 10, how hard would it be for you to eat a cup of potatoes? Um, you know, obviously, you know, resisting then exercising or resisting, you know, then purging, um, whatever those behaviors would be for you. So I think the overlap is becoming more and more understood and more um, kind of well known and talked about, which is really good. And I wish you the absolute best of luck. There's so much good help out there. For sure. Um, and I don't ever do this. I'm like imposter syndrome. But just because I feel like that um, validation and that like solidarity could be really helpful. I just did a podcast with someone who reached out to me with this overlap, like the OCD, ED, and that the, what was most frustrating for her in treatment was like no one treated both. And so the eating disorder professionals didn't really understand the OCD and vice versa. And so they continually went back and forth um, with each other. She went over amazing advice. Her name is Emily Feldman. She reached out and she says her name in the podcast. Um, um, she's on Instagram. You can follow her story. But yes, my podcast is called All the Hard Things. 
just go and listen to that most recent episode. Um, it's her personal account. And I think that would just give you a lot of solidarity to know that you're not alone. And she has a lot of awesome, awesome advice for that. Right. So many good questions, you guys. I love this. That's fantastic questions. Yeah, this, and this is, I love, I loved doing it on my own, but it's way more fun doing it with someone. Having someone here to kind of like bounce ideas off of. Likewise. All right, Troy, how do I stop having the urge to text my ex after a toxic relationship? I keep thinking maybe I should go back because she should have changed her traits. So first things first, relationship OCD um, is a newer, I think like for the maybe last like five to seven years, it's been getting more talk, more research, more clinical kind of recognition, um, which I think has been helpful for a lot of people. Um, but we're still learning a lot about it. Um, so you're definitely not alone, Troy. I'm sure you're in good company here. Um, so what stands out to me first is how do I stop having the urge? So I want all of you, including you, Troy, not to fault yourself for having the urge. So you can't necessarily help the feeling. You can't necessarily help the urge. Those are things that have been reinforced for a very, very, very long time. It's going to be really difficult to say, stop having that urge. Stop feeling anxious or anything like that, right? Like if, if that was that easy, then Dr. Farrell and I wouldn't have jobs. Right. If you could just stop having the urge, um, if there was like a magic thing to do or a magic thing to say that was quicker, then it would, you know, not be as hard as it is for so many people. But I would focus and what I would focus on with my members at No CD is to focus on the behaviors, focus on how you respond to those urges, whether you kind of give in to those urges, whether that's to text her or to look up um, your old text messages together, to look up old pictures to ruminate and try to like review old memories um, with the purpose of trying to figure it out or feel better about something? Or do you resist those? Letting yourself have that urge and continuing to move about your day as normally scheduled programming, um, engaging with your values regardless of how you feel. And you're gonna feel those urges. You're gonna feel urges the same way that someone who's not washing their hands is probably gonna feel dirty. You're gonna feel those urges the same way that if I say no to my son for, you no, know, you can't have a lollipop at four o'clock in the morning, he, I, I can say no, but he's still gonna, he's still gonna want the lollipop, right? Um, now, after some time and some repetition and some consistency with not responding to that urge by going back and ritualizing or texting or whatever, then eventually you'll find that that urge isn't as frequent and that that urge isn't as fierce. Like you'll, you'll feel, I think, a lot more kind of autonomy and agency and control over that urge. Um, but definitely don't mark your progress. Anyone out there, do not mark your progress based on like how you feel or um, especially in the beginning of treatment or this endeavor of yours. Don't mark your treatment or the, your progress in treatment based on how you feel or like your level of urges. Um, Mark it based on how you're responding to those urges because that's really what's within your control. Dr. Farrell. Well, Troy, the part here that sticks out to me about this question is um, when I when I see you right because she could have changed her traits. And that that to me, Troy, represents something that a lot of our members at No CD struggle with, perhaps the biggest monster, if you will, that we help people fight back against is, is doubt and uncertainty about could this happen, could it not? And a lot of people, um, you know, particularly people who um, struggle with OCD, find doubt about even, even normal things like this, like, a, you know, a relationship that hasn't gone so well, but maybe could improve doubt and uncertainty over that. Very difficult to tolerate. Um, and it's oftentimes quick snap um, uh, decisions or, you know, trying to as, as immediately as possible escape that doubt that keeps a person kind of stuck, never believing that, hey, I, I can accept and I can tolerate not knowing the answer here if this relationship is good or isn't meant to be. Um, and so, you know, what, what we're encouraging people to do, Troy, broadly is to try to do something different in response to their doubt or uncertainty instead of trying to look for the quickest escape from it. Um, to try to sit with it, to try to accept it, to, you know, uh, in, in, invite it into your house for a cup of coffee and just let let the uncertainty and the doubt be present. Uh, because I'll tell you what, Troy, what most people find out 
is when they change their response to uncertainty and doubt, they develop a an improved relationship with it. And when I say improved relationship, what I'm referring to is a better ability to tolerate it. That doesn't mean the doubt and the anxiety goes away completely, but one learns that, hey, I can handle this, I can endure this, and go on and do the things that I want to in my life, um, even in the face of, of uncomfortable doubt. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would echo that, and I would add on one last piece. I love Dr. Reed Wilson, Dr. Farrell. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He is like one of my favorites. Um, so all of you can look up Dr. Reed Wilson, R-E-I-D Wilson on YouTube. He has amazing YouTube videos, um, lots of awesome self-help stuff for ERP and for people who have OCD. Um, something that I took away from a lot of his teachings is that OCD doesn't really have, like that it has nothing to do with content essentially. Um, that and, and this is something that has really, I think, bolstered my own clinical practice within like the last year since I've I've learned about it more. Um, that what I would say, Troy, is that your OCD doesn't actually have really all that much to do with your ex girlfriend. Um, that really it's about doubt. It's about uncertainty, like Dr. Farrell said. And so let's say that you did do this. Let's say that you did follow through with your urges. OCD would kind of be lurking there in the background. You might doubt the fact that you did that, right? Um, and let's say that that even was all hunky dory with your ex, it would be lurking for you. It, it would be with someone else or it might come up in some other form or some other fashion. So we have to understand that this actually has nothing to do with the content. Dr. Reed Wilson would actually say we need not even pay attention to, to kind of the superficial ways that the OCD comes about. Um, of course, it latches on to things that we value, so on and so forth, um, but that it actually has so much more to do with just the general intolerance of uncertainty and that doubt that is so, so obnoxious to, to many of you. Um, so yeah, really great question. Mm -mm. Dun, da, 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 da. You guys are the best. That's great. Thank you. You guys are the best. Hey, Jenna, what do you think about, um, I'm seeing a, a great question from anxious me one, two, three. Anxious me one, two, three. Let me try to find it. It's just above the one that Troy just asked in our, in our uh, little list on the Okay, I will get to it. I will get to it. You can just say it. Can you say it? And I'll then I'll yeah, yeah, up. sure. Actually, yep. I, I didn't think of that. That's a simple. That's a simple solution. <laughs> We're oh. such a great team. We're such a great Anx team. Anxious me comes with, I think, a great question. It's frankly one that Jen and I could probably spend hours on. So the question is: Would you say that OCD is entirely within our ability to control? Are we completely in control of stopping our compulsions, or do you believe that there could be a biological side to the hardship? Um, it's a it's a fascinating question, uh, anxious me, and thank thank you for asking it. Um, in in this approach that Jenna and I have been discussing to treatment ERP exposure and response prevention, we do try to help our members understand that many of their compulsive safety behaviors are within their control. Um, and that's that's really why it's one of the major targets for treatment. We try to, as quickly as possible, identify those, uh, reduce them, and then move as swiftly as possible to eliminating them. Now, Anxious Me asks a really good question that could there be a biological side to the hardship that's perhaps a little bit outside of people's control? Uh, there is no question that there are biological contributors to OCD, um, particularly, as it relates to some of the more um, seemingly automatic behaviors that we see in OCD, oftentimes uh, ticks and others, other similar um, uh, body-focused behaviors present with OCD. And they're undoubtedly, um, the literature is clear, there are neurobiological contributors to these behaviors. Um, on top of that, just like Jenna and I would be encouraging any member to not try to control or stop intrusive or unwanted thoughts, images, or ideas that come to mind. I also, I think, um, operate the same way when I'm educating members that mental compulsions, we can't necessarily expect a person to have complete control over those. So if a person has, let's say, a good, clean, safe peer thought that they use deliberately to kind of replace you know, a, a, a seemingly bad, intrusive, unwanted thought, a lot of our members describe a very automatic 
um, <laughs> a very automatic way that those those safe thoughts come about. And so sometimes it's not as straightforward as encouraging a person to stop their hand washing or checking behaviors or praying or other other things that we you know, in theory, have a little bit more 100% um, behavioral control over. But what about compulsions that are mental, not necessarily physical in nature? Um, do we have complete control over those? Um, in my experience, some people say, you know, uh, I, I don't seem to have control over those, just like I don't have control over my intrusive thoughts. It's kind of like that, that safe thought just kind of pops into mind. So what do we do when it feels like we don't have control over our compulsions? Well, here's the good news. We can always try to identify some kind of counter response. So hypothetical example, um, you have an intrusive, unwanted thought that comes to mind that's maybe counter to your religion. And you're a very religious person, so you experience this thought as very upsetting. And almost immediately, seemingly automatically in response to this, you have a more pure, clean, um, pro-religious thought, shall we say. Um, I'll just give an example here. Uh, God is good. It is just an automatic thought that might come to mind. So what we might encourage a member to do if he was to say, you know, Nick, or, you know, Jenna, I don't even feel like I'm necessarily in control. That thought just kind of, boom, automatically pops to mind. I'm not trying to necessarily bring it about. We might encourage, OK, it just kind of came about, but we don't have to accept it. You know, we, we, we can do something to kind of undo this thought. Can we find a creative way to reintroduce you know, that kind of counter-religious thought that made you very anxious and concerned in the first place. Jenna, any further thoughts on this about how we might encourage members to respond to any compulsions or safety behaviors that seemingly come on in an automatic or uncontrolled fashion? Yeah, for sure. So I definitely, I hear all the time that people who experience mental compulsions and kind of pure, oh, I know that's a controversial term, but some people I'm sure can resonate with that. Um, so I hear all the time that people who experience mental compulsions, they feel this very common, you know, experience that it just feels so automatic. I can't just stop it. Um, and I think there is some wiggle room there. Um, like Dr. Farrell had said, I do, I do think that you can kind of be creative. Um, like undoing is a really important thing that we would introduce, like he had mentioned. So again, let's say that you go through a door, but kind of automatically you feel the need to, you know, you, you just think of a good vacation because like you can't go through door thresholds without having a good thought or a good image. Well, you could undo that, right? Like, okay, dang, I did that. Oh my gosh. Okay. Maybe you try going through the door again, but with a bad thought, um, like or the worst place that you could possibly imagine instead of like Florida or California or something like that. Um, yeah, so like he said, just trying to be creative to find a way to intentionally kind of ruffle the OCD's feathers. What we don't want is for the OCD to have long lasting fulfillment. We don't want the OCD to kind of be happy with with the rituals or even the automatic ones that we've done. So we want to kind of just ruffle its feathers a little bit. Um, another kind of visualization that comes to mind, um, I think the importance, especially when it comes to mental compulsions, the importance of self-awareness and self-monitoring is so important. Like it's just huge. So I would especially in these situations give people like a self-monitoring form or like some way to kind of track, okay, I'm I said that I, you know, I had that automatic thought again, or I had this thought again, or I had that automatic compulsion again. I'm ruminating right now. Um, and then give some like more detailed information about kind of what scenarios under which they are engaging in those things. There might be more of a pattern than meets the eye. So, uh, you know, I see that a lot of times ruminating happens, more ruminating happens at night, happens like alone on long drives. Um, so that might be helpful as far as you and for your therapist to be able to kind of plan ahead, right? So if someone typically ruminates a lot during a long drive to work because they're alone, there's not a whole lot of distraction, we can know in advance, okay, you know, I mean, going into the car for my hour long drive to work usually is challenging for me. My goal is to try to do this. And my only job is to not give in to this compulsion. So I think you can kind of have a counter strategy. Um, your OCD has a strategy, and I think everyone who has OCD needs their own counter strategy. And so I would encourage, especially when it comes to the automatic rituals, to try to treat OCD like a game of chess. You really want to try to be a step ahead of the game and know where your opponent is gonna go so that you can be a step ahead of the game and be like, yep, 
I know I have a long drive ahead of me. I know that I tend to think on old conversations to try to remember if I said something offensive. So my only goal is to try not to review that information. And I'm for this entire drive, I'm going to try to stay present and I'm going to try to just allow that uncomfortableness to be there. I am not going to try to conjure up those thoughts of those old conversations. So for me, it would boil down to, you know, a lot of self monitoring, self awareness with the effort of trying to identify patterns so that you can be a step ahead of the game. And like Dr. Farrell said, a lot of undoing, just trying to do whatever you can to, to like, you know, just fluster its feathers a little bit, just make it angry. Invite it in, all that good stuff. Really good question. Mm -mm. I feel really passionately about this. I have a therapist um, that deals with OCD, but doesn't believe that Googling, reassurance seeking, loops of questions leading to more questions is OCD. Um, the therapist wants to just help my anxiety. Would that be enough? So something that I feel really, really strongly about um, and part of my own mission and wanting to join no CD was kind of educating other therapists about the dangers of just talk therapy, like just general kind of unstructured talk therapy for OCD in particular. Um, it would be my dream to have therapists like starting in college when we're all kind of in our like intro to psychology classes or, you know, intro to counseling classes that we're all kind of educated on OCD and exposure and response prevention. But unfortunately, I don't think that's the case. Um, maybe one day. Um, but my opinion on this, I definitely think that, you know, someone, someone who has anxiety in jail, it seems like you are identifying already some problematic behaviors for you. Um, these might not necessarily be problematic behaviors for someone else, right? Like, and that's all, that's all relative. That would have to be something that you and your therapist talk about in that situation. But if it seems like you're identifying them as problematic for yourself, right? Like my loops of questions lead to more questions. Um, you're obviously here and you're asking about it. And so what I would want to empower you to do is if you feel like you have OCD and you feel like these things are problematic and they're not being addressed, like I would certainly want any of my members to advocate for themselves too. So um, I don't know, hopefully you feel that ability and you feel that level of comfort to be able to advocate for yourself. But um, I, at least even to ask, like at least even to ask, you know, like I've had some thoughts about this. Like I, I know that this is what I've read online. You know, I was at this really awesome webinar with Dr. Farrell and Jenna Overbaugh. And, you know, I know that lead, asking these questions, it kind of makes me feel better in the moment, but it leads to me wanting to ask more questions. You say that, you know, maybe maybe this isn't a ritual, but I'm still kind of convinced that it might be like, can we have a conversation about that? Um, and hopefully your therapist would be open to that. But my I mean, my first gut reaction is if it's becoming problematic and these questions are leading to more questions, obviously something isn't working. Right. So I don't know, Dr. Farrell, do you have anything else? Well, um, I, I, I think it's important to say this up front, Jail, that we, you know, with just a limited bit of information here, um, we, we can't really necessarily comment on the, the work that you're doing with your therapist and whether it's right or wrong. Uh, that said, based on this information, I, I find it hard to imagine how I could go about me as a professional helping someone with their anxiety without addressing things like Googling, reassurance seeking, loops of questions leading to more questions that appear to be fueling the anxiety. Yeah, um, they're all related they're, too. You're <laughs> right, 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 right. Those, right. those are all related. They're not like hand washing, um, Googling and confessing to the police. <laughs> they are like, right. they're all related. Yeah, um, and so I, I think that, um, I, I, what, what, I, what I, I think is gonna be important for you to, um, emphasize jail is that the the treatment that you're receiving uh is is exposure and response prevention um that's that's advice i would give to any friend any family member that is dealing with ocd and asks me questions about hey i'm doing this or that with a therapist the the the, the first line question needs to be hey are, are we doing erp uh and and what does that look like because again uh, i'm aware that that's the gold standard treatment uh for helping folks overcome ocd mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think so many people, oh my gosh, I cannot tell you how many people, I, I think 
it's 10 to 17 years uh, that people kind of have the onset of obsessive compulsive symptoms to when they actually get ERP for it. And I think that the pre like the therapist not knowing any different, like they just, they just don't know. And hopefully we can get the word out to them a little bit more, but yeah, it's a long road for people from when they first develop uh, symptoms um, to when they can actually get into that really good ERP. But the ERP is, is the ticket for sure. Yeah. And Jayla, I'm not sure if this is going on, um, but sometimes when we hear that um, clinicians are using an approach to deal with the anxiety, um, oftentimes those are well-intended approaches to reduce anxiety through, you know, various uh, anxiety reduction strategies like using diaphragmatic breathing or muscle relaxation techniques or a, a whole host of other things that may or may not reduce a person's anxiety. And again, while those suggestions are practical and well-intentioned, um, the, the sad reality is they've been compared time and time again to other frontline strategies like ERP um, and, and have been consistently outperformed. A lot of times what Jenna and I find in our work is that those strategies are kind of a temporary band-aid that may, you know, for a short while reduce someone's anxiety but the, the source of it continues, you know, through, through the, the obsessions uh, and the compulsive behaviors that follow. Mm -hmm. Right. I think, I mean, I think all therapists, especially when we first start, before we start to specialize, we, we want to help, right? Like we want to help. We come into this field because we want to help people. Like we are just those people on the inside. We want to, we don't want people to leave our office upset. We don't want people to leave our office crying. We want them to feel better when they leave. And, and that might be, I mean, very well intentioned for any talk therapist. They just want to provide a coping skill. They want to provide some type of relaxation strategy. And for some disorders, for some symptoms that might be okay. We can't, I can't really speak to that. Um, but for obsessive compulsive disorder, you absolutely need ERP. All right. Cassidy has a question. I suffer from HOCD, harm OCD, for those of you who aren't aware, and it was just um, set on recently by finding out I'm pregnant, wondering what I can do when I have intrusive thoughts and um, I am unable to let them pass through. So I picked this one because I this is just really close to my heart. I'm a mom. I have a toddler, three years old, um, and I, I think first and foremost, like this is already such a trying time when you're pregnant, um, when you have a you know you're starting a family. And just it breaks my heart whenever women start to struggle with intrusive thoughts at this time because the expectation set by society is that it's all great and it's so lovely. And, and there are parts of it that are that way for sure. But this part isn't talked about. Um, I'm sure you would find, Cassidy, that as you become more open and if that's part of your journey, if you become more open about your symptoms, I guarantee you suddenly women would start to be like, me too, Cassidy, me too. But it's just, it's a very, I've done a lot of like personal work on this and a lot of clinical research in it too. It's just part of the societal motherhood cycle that we don't talk about these things because obviously you can imagine, you know, associations with being a bad mom, so on and so forth. So all of that is to say that having intrusive thoughts, first of all, we all have intrusive thoughts. Research shows that we all have intrusive thoughts, um, and especially women who are pregnant, women who are just becoming moms, even dads. Um, so there, there are a lot of reasons for that. One is obviously hormonal changes and just tons of life changes, right? So Dr. Farrell referenced earlier in the chat about how like life stressors can really be co can coincide with those really like revving up symptoms of OCD. I think that definitely contributes. Hormones can definitely play a role here. Um, not to mention, which I think this exists whether you're pregnant or you have a baby, OCD latches on to anything that's uncertain, anything that you value, and anything that's vulnerable. Talk about motherhood and parenthood in general, right? Like, Having a baby, let a, especially pregnancy, right? Because we don't know what's going on in there. We don't have 100% certainty about anything that's going on in there. OCD is going to latch onto that or try to. Um, anything that's vulnerable, right? There's something called the Arnold Schwarzenegger effect. No one has intrusive thoughts about Arnold Schwarzenegger because he's big and he's burly. You know, people with OCD generally have intrusive thoughts, especially harm intrusive thoughts about the elderly, the sick 
the pregnant and babies and children because they're vulnerable. And so totally makes sense again, why OCD would kind of latch onto this. And again, third, the third like punch here is OCD will try to latch onto anything that we value. So again, what do we value more than our own children? What do we value more than our own family members? Right. And so, um, uncertainty values and vulnerability the plus hormones plus major life stressors so just want to give you some context for kind of what's going on you're not experiencing these things because you're bound to be a bad mom you're not experiencing these things because x y and z you're experiencing these things because and it's an evolutionary thing it's an evolutionary thing so you know your body your brain more than wanting to keep you alive wants to keep that baby alive and so research shows that especially moms will have these like upticks and intrusive thoughts that are harm related um, as a way to kind of generate fear to kind of check and make sure like that they're not going to do it. And so, again, that is all to say, just to give you a lot of context, um, long winded way of saying that this is common. Um, so with that said, the same ERP things would apply. Everything that we've talked about, regardless of the type of OCD or the context of OCD, the same things that we're talking about would apply. So trying really hard to not judge yourself for having the thoughts. We can't help the thoughts that we're having, can't help the thoughts that pop up, but everything else that kind of happens after that point, how we respond to the thought, how we give, whether we give into it, whether we resist it, those are all things that we would try to get you to kind of see that you are in control of. And my best advice when it comes to this is in addition to like finding a great support group for moms, um, you could also, you could definitely check out our um, no CD peer support groups. We have lots of moms join. So you can access those by um, heading onto your no CD app. They're free. You don't have to be getting services through no CD to benefit. Um, I run the one every Wednesday at seven central. We have lots of moms on there actually. Um, so it would be good support for you there. In addition to getting that like peer support, which I research has shown is super important for moms in particular, um, I would encourage, um, what was I gonna encourage? I felt so strongly about it and I lost it. <laughs> Dr. Farrell, take over while I try to remember. All right, it's gonna come to you, Jenna. Just go ahead and interrupt me. Um, sure. Cassidy, congratulations. I mean, what, what wonderful news. Uh, this is so awesome. Uh, and you know, from from Jenna and I, uh, best wishes on a happy and healthy experience with your pregnancy. Um, I'm just going to tack on really quickly to a lot of the great advice and suggestions that Jenna had. First of all, we get asked this question a lot: Can what about ERP and pregnancy at the same time? Great news! It's been studied and it is safe, uh, and it, it is a, it is a good thing for expecting mothers who are you know starting to experience worsening in symptoms. Um, and so if, if, if that was a concern weighing on your mind at all, Cassidy, definitely safe for you to proceed uh, with, with, with ERP. Um, I want to touch on the last part of your, your, your um, question here. I'm unable to let them pass through. And Cassidy, I'm, I'm going to gently challenge you here, and I'm going to empower you at the same time. This is a belief that is probably one of the core underlying beliefs that cuts across a lot of different OCD subtypes, the belief that this distressing experience, whatever it is, whether it's related to a certain thought, image, impulse, bizarre idea that I have, I cannot tolerate the distress associated with it. And it's fair to look at exposure and response prevention therapy as an opportunity for folks to learn that they can, in fact, tolerate it. They don't have to like it. Seldom do people ever become fond uh, of, of their intrusive mental content. But a majority of people who go through a course of treatment are able to successfully learn, I can, in fact, allow this thought to be present. Do nothing about it. Don't have to you know, talk myself out of it. Just let it be, let it run its natural course and learn that you know, nothing catastrophic happens in response to having this thought. And also I'm capable of tolerating and enduring it. So Cassie, I know from your perspective, it feels right now like you're unable to let these thoughts pass. Give it time, persist, um, and get a support network around you that can encourage you because I'm confident that you are capable uh, of enduring this, this period of difficulty. Mm -hmm. I remembered what I was going to say. <laughs> I, I, I just know as a mom, like it feels like the stakes are too high. The stakes are too high. Like I need to get rid of this knife or I need to get rid of this pair of scissors. Like I, the stakes are just too high. I would just encourage you and I would encourage everybody to 
do what feels, do what's going to set you up for success for the next five years or the next 50 years, not for the next five minutes. Okay. Because getting rid of that knife, if that's, I'm just making an assumption could just be generalization, but harm OCD. I'm just giving an example. Um, let's say that you're having an intrusive thought that like, what if I just grab this knife and I hurt myself or I hurt my baby with it? Um, you know, as, as tempting as it might be to put away that knife or to drop it or to, you know, not go into the kitchen or whatever it is, as tempting as it might be to like, you know, check your baby's, baby's kicks or, you know, check your baby's heartbeat or whatever. Try really, really hard to just allow that anxiety to be there and continue going on with your normally scheduled programming. If you were going to watch a movie with your partner, watch a movie with your partner. Try to resist those rituals as much as you can, knowing again, trying to do what feels good for the next five minutes, do what feels good for the next five years, what's going to set you up for the next five years for success, not for the next five minutes. Um, and my other moment that I forgot to mention, um, I think a lot of times people, especially in pregnancy, when they experience these intrusive thoughts, they are, they can, it's easy to justify sometimes um, like, oh, I'm just going to do this while I'm pregnant. Like as soon as the baby's here and, and the baby's here, then I, I, I won't be doing this anymore. The OCD will will could continue even after the baby is here, right? So um, I know a lot of times people are like, well, as soon as the baby's here and alive, then I won't have anything to check. Like, Dr. Farrell, you have kids. The potential to check only increases exponentially once they're here. Um, and so my advice is to really take advantage of this time and take advantage of obviously your willingness to come here and learn more. Try to get it as under control as you can now and, and get help now if you can so that when the baby does come, you know, it doesn't have room to grow or and you can kind of contain it um, because having kids is kind of nuts and be kind of wild. Really great questions. Thank you, Cassidy. So, yeah. So I don't know, Dr. Farrell, do we have time for one more quick one? Yeah, you bet. Let's do it. Super, super quick. Roll of the dice. You pick one, Dr. Farrell. Um, let's see. I saw one earlier that I thought was particularly important. You know, we've really sung the praises of ERP and, um, it was, uh, Morgan, Morgan asked earlier, what if we have tried ERP and it didn't work? Very fair question. I'll come back to a point that we made before. Um, ERP sadly is not a panacea. Uh, it, it is not associated with a hundred percent benefit. Um, and, you know, as skilled and helpful as Jenna and I probably like to think we are, I can guarantee you we've both had cases where we felt, gosh, we did everything in our power here to use ERP as skillfully as we can. And lo and behold, it didn't seem to work. Um, Morgan, my, my answer uh, to this question is rather simple. Try again. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't tell you how many times, especially Jenna and I both have experience working in higher levels of care. We've worked with folks that have seemingly you know they're on their sixth or seventh time and i wish i could explain this scientifically i can't but all i can say is sometimes it clicks um it might be just that um you find a different working relationship with a different therapist you know not all erp therapists are created the same um in fact there's quite a bit of variability and so you might just um work better with a different style um i've had folks say to me you know nick even though my first go around with erp wasn't successful, I remembered key pieces from it. I remembered some of the, the core tenets. And that was, a, that was a big foundation then the second time around. I kind of knew what I had to do and came into that second course of treatment, maybe more invested in making big changes. Um, anything you would say here, Jenna? Yeah, I love just keeping it at try again. And there are so many reasons why this could have happened. So many reasons personal to you, Morgan, personal to the therapist, personal to other external scenarios, life situations. Like there are so many different things that could have explained why it didn't work. And like Dr. Farrell said, it's not a 100% guarantee for sure. But the latest research that I've looked at and what I always try to tell people um, is that ERP is more effective, has been shown to be more effective for OCD than any other treatment for any other disorder. Um, and so as awful as OCD is, and the fact that it didn't work for you, even though it's not 100%, the bang for your buck is pretty good. Um, and so there are just too many factors to get to identify kind of why it didn't. Um, but definitely try again. Yeah. And I can totally echo that. I've worked with people 
who have, especially working in residential, like we're usually their last stop. Like they've tried ERP for years before, but suddenly they get to like a higher level of care and it's what they needed. And um, I've worked with plenty of people who have had me before and then they come back to me and we do the same stuff, but you know, it just clicks a different time or it's just a different time in their life. Or maybe I learned more. Maybe I was more creative with their exposures. Maybe, you know, for instance, you should have seen me before I had a, before I had my toddler, I was like, really strict and like by the book and rigid after I had my toddler, I'm like way more compassionate. So like things just happen, things change. And so I would challenge you if you had a negative experience or just one that wasn't very effective, give it another try. Um, it could be radically different for sure. Like if I could go back and seven years ago, like treat all those people again, maybe it wouldn't be different. I don't know. We'll never know. But things change. So just give it a chance. That was so fun. That Thank you fun. so much, you guys. Hey, I know there were uh, quite a number of awesome questions that unfortunately we didn't get to. Uh, we'll look forward to continuing to do these regularly. Uh, and thank you so much for tuning in and for asking such great questions. Thanks, yeah. everybody. This was so fun. Thank you, guys. Bye. Take, take care.